Well, in this video we look at the Soviet perspective of Allied support for the Soviet Union, generally called Land Lease. And spoilers, according to their official history, it had a limited impact. Probably more interesting is how they argue and what data they present. Because there's something we can learn from. Note, for this I use the official German translation of the history of the Great Patriotic War of the Soviet Union, which was published originally in Russian from 1960 to 1965 and subsequently by the German Democratic Republic from 1962 to 1968. Additionally, I also use a German version of the Great Patriotic War book that was originally written by the leading Soviet historian Boris Zinemtyevich Tepulchovsky. He was the deputy leader of the department about the Great Patriotic War at the Institute for Marxism-Leninism at the Central Committee of the Socialist Party in Moscow. Being thank you to all my Patreons that made this video possible. Note that the German version was altered in various ways and not just due to translation issues. This will be discussed in further detail at the end of the video. In the short version of the Great Patriotic War book, Landlease is called a minor support that only made up 4% of the Soviet economic demands. To quote, During the war, supplies from the Allies also played a certain role in supplying the population and the Soviet army with food and industrial goods for the state budget. It must be emphasized, however, that the specific weight of supplies of industrial goods from abroad amounted to only 4% of requirements. The claims of the bourgeoisie, all of course, about the enormous impact that the aid of the land lease program supposedly played in the victory of the Soviet Union over fascist Germany are not worthy of attention. Thus, General Westphal writes, in, in order to belittle the power of the Soviet Union, the American supplies helped to an enormous extent to compensate the Red Colossus for the losses it had suffered in the first months of the war and gradually strengthened the military power of the Soviets. It is no exaggeration to say that without this enormous American support, the Soviet troops would hardly have to been able to attack in 1943. Furthermore, it is noted that the United Kingdom received far more. It is known that while Great Britain received $30 billion in land lease material, deliveries to the USSR amounted to only about one third of this amount, namely $9.8 billion. The bulk of the goods, namely 69%, were received by the state from domestic factories and plants. Note that these numbers are too low. According to various sources, the total would be $50 billion US dollars, whereas $10.2 billion US dollars were for the Soviet Union, and 31 billion for the British Empire. So this includes Canada, New Zealand and Australia, which also were in the war from 1939 onwards. In one of the following paragraphs, this is noted. The decisive successes of the Soviet people in economic reconstruction in 1944 and 1945 proved that the economic basis of the Soviet state is incomparable, more viable than the economy of the capitalist states. This is probably one of the driving factors for downplaying the role of land lease. Yet let us look at why just 4% probably does not cut it at all. I think there's a crucial missing factor here, namely division of labor on an international scale that increases the production efficiency of the Soviet Union. Let's start with division of labor, which allowed for specialization. This had a significant advantage. The Soviets had a wide range of weapon systems that were perfectly suited for the Eastern Front, the T-34, the KV-1 and various others. Yet they were seriously lacking in terms of radios, radars and trucks. Whereas the United States had an excellent electronics and automobile industry. There was no immediately available domestic capacity for serial production for reliable motor vehicles, communications equipment and so on. The replacement of high-grade imports would have required large quantities of domestically produced low-grade horsepower and equipment. This would always represent an inferior option. For example, railway transport could not solve the problem of dispersal of supplies across a front line of combat from the railhead. To give a specific example for radios, Alexander Hill notes, for example, the 71 Tiki free radio set used for two-way communication from tanks was according to one tanker a complex unreliable radio set. Very often it failed and it was very difficult to get it working again. Later land lease sets with the capability for higher frequency operation for effective short-range communication would highlight just how inadequate Soviet radio equipment all too often was. 
As such, the specialization increased the effectiveness of the usage by using better equipment, for instance US radio and Soviet tanks, and additionally both sides also get efficiency due to serial production. In the official history another aspect is used, namely omitting comparable data. It should be emphasized that the socialist state was able to solve the difficult problem of re-equipping and supplying the material and technical requirements of an army of millions from its own economic resources. In the post-war years, Bushi's propaganda made, made no small effort to persuade the world public that the increasing technical equipment of the Red Army in the course of the war was largely due to Allied supplies of weapons, technology and material of various kinds by the United States and Great Britain. Of course, the importance of these supplies should not be underestimated, especially in supplying the troops and hinterland with motor vehicles, fuels and lubricants. The USA and Great Britain supplied 401,000 motor vehicles and 2.6 million tons of, of petroleum products. Measured against the overall increase in the Red Army's armament, however, Allied aid played an insignificant role overall. According to the Russian historian Sokolov, the Soviet Union produced 265,000 non-armored motor vehicles during the war, so far less. Be aware that the number given by the official history actually might be too low. Glance notes 409,000 trucks and 47,000 jeeps. Yet it is rather apparent that the trucks provided by the Western Allies were very important in both absolute and relative terms. In the end, the Russians received many more trucks on the land lease than the Germans were able to build for themselves. Furthermore, they were also of better quality as well. The Studebakers not only carried 50% more tonnage on average than similar Soviet trucks, they were considerably more robust and could stay in operation much longer. Be aware that newer research by HDV Davy suggests that Studebakers might have less impact on the Soviet military campaigns than some claim, but the impact was clearly higher than the official Soviet historiography. The omission of the Soviet automobile number production in the official history previously is likely intentional. Because shortly afterwards both Soviet industry and land lease data is provided for different products, which suggests that the Soviet production was just way higher and thus the reader likely will think that the Soviet produced also far more automobiles as well. The part is as follows. During the war Soviet industry produced 489,900 artillery pieces of all calibers, 136,800 aircraft, 102,500 102, tanks and self-propelled guns. In the same period, the USA and Great Britain supplied 9,600 guns, 9,600 guns, 18,700 aircraft and 10,800 tanks. Consequently, Allied deliveries of artillery pieces amount to less than 2% aircraft to around 12% and tanks to 10% of the respective total quantities received by the Red Army during the war. In addition, the Allies also supplied obsolete types of weapons. The tanks in large proportion of aircraft, for example, no longer fully met the armament requirements of this fighting on the Soviet-German front. Now it is without question that the Western Allies provided some outdated equipment like Hurricanes and M3 tanks. Yet out of these almost 11,000 tanks, more than 3,000 were Sherman tanks that were clearly not outdated. Another 3,300 were British Valentine tanks that were well liked by the Soviets, although generally used in the light tank role, although far better armored. The Soviet production numbers of tanks and artillery are very impressive. Yet as previously stated, some of these numbers could only be achieved since the Soviet industry could focus relentlessly on these products, since trucks, radios and other equipment was imported in large numbers. Additionally, the Allies also provided important manufacturing equipment, namely machine tools, and those are very important for the production of these weapon systems. In all, during the war years, the USA supplied the USSR with 38,100 metal learning Caddy Lafis, and Great Britain sent the USSR 6,500 machine tools, and 104 metal presses. During the period 1945 to 1945, 115,400 metal cutting lathes were produced in the Soviet Union, that is 2.6 times more than were provided by land lease. In actuality, however, if you take the value of the index, then the role of the Western machine tools turns out decisive. They were far more complex and valuable than the Soviets. 
Be aware there are many different assessments about land lease out there. Here is a short collection of the most interesting quotes I found so far. It is known that Stalin privately viewed the aid as vital to Soviet survival. Nikita Khrushchev, his successor, recalled in a taped interview in the 1960s, released only 30 years later, that Stalin had on a number of occasions told his close circle that without land lease, the Soviet Union would not have been able to cope. Whereas the military historian Glantz notes, if Western allies had not provided equipment and invaded Northwest Europe, Stalin and his commanders might have taken 12 to 18 months longer to finish off the Wehrmacht. Which is in stark contrast to the views of the Russian historian Boris Sokolov. As a whole, one can reach the conclusion that without the Western supplies, the Soviet Union not only could not have won the Great Patriot War, but even could not have resisted German aggression since it was not able to brew sufficient quantities of weapons and combat equipment and provide them with fuel and ammunition. Yet I think probably the best statement most people can agree with is the one from Mark Harrison. Without land lease, everyone would have had a worse war. The Western allies would have had to kill and be killed in greater numbers. The Russians would have done less killing and more being killed. Finally, some words on the Soviet sources used. The Soviets published their history of the Great Baltic War in Russia, Yet, the German version was actually a bit altered, and not just due to issues with translation. There were various statements in the original version that were obviously wrong. For instance, it was a publication in which more German submarines were sunk in the Baltic Sea alone than existed, and a statement that fascist Germany intended to take immediate action against the USSR after the invasion of Poland had to be corrected by deletion. This of course could lead to some obvious problems. In order to prevent the German and Soviet versions from being played off against each other, the solution was devised of using an imaginary second Russian edition, which was not published at all, as a model for the German text. Hardly had the agreed corrections been made in 1962, when as a result of the 12th Communist Party of the Soviet Union Party Congress, the original Soviet version was changed and Molotov, for example, disappeared. As such, some aspects in my German version are different from the Russian original or better originals. One minor aspect you might have noticed is that in the translation Second World War is not capitalized. This is not an error. In East Germany, Zweiter Weltkrieg, Second World War was not seen as a proper noun in contrast to Western Germany or Austria, where it is Zweiter Weltkrieg, Second World War. Although recently I have also seen a West German publication from 1970 that also used a non-capitalized version. Anyway, since I'm sticking close to the original, I did not capitalize the word either in the translation. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script, thank you for watching and see you next time.